a long trip to do to come here. He's at University of Alberta, and uh, he's uh, an ICO chair there. He's uh, one of the most famous uh, contributors to machine learning, in particular to reinforcement learning. Uh, he wrote a book you may have heard of uh, called uh, Reinforcement Learning uh, and Introduction. Uh, that's very well known and read. And uh, he uh, graduated from MIT and uh, Stanford. And he's very interested, and has been for many years, in uh, animal learning, neural networks, artificial intelligence, and of course, enforcement learning. And today, he has a really exciting title, so I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, hey, uh, uh, do you want to um, use this or use this? Uh, choices. Yeah, like you. Okay. Excited about that, um, and it just seems like it's it's really good. So since I'm starting out uh, the the meeting, I just want to you know just start by thanking the organizers for for uh, bringing us to such a nice place. So thank you very much. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk to you about this really. Uh, exciting topic, and it's been uh, important. Representation learning has been an important part of artificial intelligence about machine learning forever. It's just one of the basic, basic problems, and it's 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 exciting for me to see now uh, at, in the, in these years it, it's having its own conferences and becoming recognized and really worked on hard by you guys. Uh, so I mean, I, I really feels like we've, we've finally come uh, to uh, a time when we can work hard on it and make make good good progress. I'm really excited about that, um, and I want to sort of congratulate you all for, for um, you know, for, for getting to this point and recognizing that, that, that this problem is key. Okay, but at the same time, I, I think we are uh, we have many struggles in the field, uh, uh, and I would say sort of methodological struggles and struggles to, to try to figure out what are the, the key issues. It's, it can be. Um, Difficult to separate the real things from uh, superficial things, and so that's what I originally uh, uh, started to structure this talk around things that we might believe that are myths or challenges to our methodology, and how they might be leading us astray. astray. And um, and but as I prepared the talk. Uh, really oriented around that. I decided that uh, I really wanted to present sort of a more, not necessarily a positive message, but a message actually has something specific I wanted to say. And so in addition to touching on myths, I've actually restructured my talk really more about uh, the view of representation learning that I think uh, we should be paying more attention to uh, that is being maybe lost. So let me see if I this thing works. Good. So this is the title that, I, that I'm really actually more going to speak to. Um, the view of representation learning as learning slow to enable learning fast. So let's just ask ourselves, uh, what is this field of reinforcement learning? I hope, excuse me. Uh, that's the other RL. In this talk, RL means representation learning. Um, and only representation learning. Um, OK, so. Uh, in, in, in my days, what it means to me uh, is uh, representation learning is a learning process generally takes a long time, a slow learning process, that enables subsequent learning to be fast. So we look at people, and people seem to be able to learn so, so fast. They come to a new problem, just get a little bit of data, and they can get the right answer. How do they do that? That's always been the mystery for me. How is that possible? Uh, and so the, the, the mystery is how they learn so fast. Okay, And the answer must be that somehow, from all their previous experience in their lives, they've come up with a way of representing that problem so they can learn very fast. And that, to me, is the mystery of reinforcement. 
how they can, from their lives, slowly learning, figure out a representation that enables them to learn really fast. So the short phrase is RL, representation learning enables fast learning. So uh, for me, that was certainly the original idea. It remains the strongest idea. Uh, but it's true, as I see it, I'm, I'm happy about many things going on in our field, but, but most of what goes on is, is not this. Okay, so what are some of the things that we see? We pull out four different meanings from the literature, from what people are doing, for reinforcement learning. I think we all agree that it's, it is a, a relatively slow sort of second order process around metal learning process. Everyone agrees on that, but different, there are different possible benefits. And one is what I mentioned, so I put that in first. Uh, faster learning. But we also care about just greater expressive power. And when we make deep networks and solve some problem, well, really, we're, we're, getting, we're focusing on that, that ability to approximate a complex function because we have greater expressive power. Another one, perhaps related uh, to number one, is better generalization. Because you might think, well, better generalization means you're going to learn faster. But in practice, this is not really what better generalization turns out to be. Uh, when we have uh, our large networks that, that learn, and we might measure their generalization error, but we don't then go back and see, can they learn fast? Uh, this, this is what we mean by generalization is after we've done learning, we do well on a new example, which has many uh, methodological challenges in order, in order to to, uh, how to to measure that sound. Uh, but it's different than faster learning. That's really the only point that I want to make. And of course, the fourth goal is we may want to make representations that are pleasing to us, that are simple, or that, that, that correspond to what we thought was the right way to do it. Uh, so there are these four. And I want you to ask yourselves, um, you know, which one is really the reason you're here? Which one of these benefits of reinforcement learning? Oh, <laughs> I didn't think I would have it. Representation learning are the, are the one that, uh, that matters to you, or is the reason why you're studying representation learning. And I'm just going to say RL. Um, so, I don't know, let's do a show of hands. Um, how many of you? Sort of, uh, are, are here because you think learning representation is going to get you a faster learning system. How many of you here are thinking you, you want greater expressive power? Four. And how many for generalization? Also. Okay. So, so, I, so, I, and how many just because you want to have your machine generate representations that are pleasing intuitively or simple, pleasing and to people? <laughs> Not a fewer, but uh, I see I have my work cut out for me if I want to try to try to convince you, I guess, uh, that the, the key is faster learning. Um, well, we do need to learn fast. And surely you would agree that this is a, a great mystery. How is we get those systems that learn fast? And, and that representations are part of that. Okay, yeah, so I guess let me, maybe I can get you to agree uh, that even if this isn't the, the single reason why you're here, this is one, one benefit you expect to come from learning a good representation. Okay, so I just say, how many of you agree that this is one important benefit of learning a good representation? Okay, more, but, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe I, I, because I'm not really going to argue this too, too hard. Um, I'm going to take it more as a, as a premise. Uh, and so then, so then if you're skeptical of that, let me just say that it, it would be really valuable and um, ask how we, could, how we can focus on it, how we can achieve that. Okay, so the overall outline, basically representation learning should enable fast learning, but it really doesn't in practice. What people are doing doesn't do that. And so how can we uh, make it uh, be about fast learning? What do we require? And the main thing we require is some kind of continual learning, because we have to slowly learn in order to learn fast. And this suggests uh, a non-stationary problem, and perhaps sequences of learning tasks. And, and we also, uh, I think, need a stronger methodology that allows us to make more solid conclusions. So, uh, and then the main thing I'm going to do today is present a proposal for a sort of 
challenge task, a synthetic task that gets at this issue of uh, enabling fast learning. And present some results. They're almost on the challenge task, but not really. Uh, they're not exactly. Um, and so the, the contribution, to the extent there is one, will be about the challenge task. Okay, so let's get on to the, the main, the main uh, step of the argument, which is that um, in order to focus on fast learning, we need an online uh, continual learning task. So um, representational learning is a slow second order process, so how can it enable fast learning? How can slow learning enable fast learning? It almost seems like a contradiction. Um, the answer, of course, is that you have to have the slow learning first. You have to go through your lives and learn representations, and then you have to have the opportunity for fast learning. And this, what it comes down to, is it requires learning to be continual. You have to have something before, a long period before, and then you have to have the opportunity to show off. And so it can't be one batch of data and then you stop learning. It could be a sequence of tasks where you learn representations on the early elements of the sequence, the early tasks, and then show off. Uh, perform well, learn fast, you know, in a later task in the sequence. But I think the most elegant way is really just have a continual learning task, a non-stationary task, where what you're trying to learn gradually keeps moving around, and so you can't stop, but have to keep learning. Uh, you treat time symmetrically, rather than having a before and an after, a training and a test. Okay, so let me jump right to my proposed challenge problem. Uh, I call it the Jeff challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and a little tribute to one of the founders of our field. Um, but it, the, the Jeff comes from generic online feature finding. So I want to focus on the problem of feature finding. I know you're all interested in that. Um, and, but I want to do it in a generic way. So this is a synthetic task, uh, which means it's a made up task. And made up tasks, uh, I think, actually are uh, a very good and under underappreciated uh, methodology. Uh, because if you, if you create a task, uh, you can really understand it very well, and you don't have um, you don't have the in all kinds of mysterious things understood so that you might fool yourself uh, because you don't understand exactly what's going on. And we can have a very, very well understood synthetic problem with very desirable properties, which I'll get to. But let me, let me get, so the Jeff challenge problem this generic, synthetic, feature-finding test drive, which will have an infinitely many instance tasks, because we're recreating them back randomly. Uh, so each such task will have a, a set of ideal features, uh, which we will choose randomly. So when you make the instance, the goal will be to find those randomly chosen target features or ideal features. And it's going to be an online learning problem. In fact, it's going to be online regression. So we'll have real value outputs about the square loss, IID training data. Because it's online, there's no testing. It's just continual online data, and you measure how well you do on it, uh, and then you, you train on it, That's the, uh, example by example. The target function is going to be a two-layer network with random weights, the simplest case. It's shallow, but uh, even in this case, it's going to be uh, quite, uh, well, anyway, it'll be able to focus us to focus very clearly on the problem of feature finding. So in this two-layer network, the hidden units will be the ideal target features, and the output layer will be a single unit uh, with S as the non-stationary weights, non-stationary aspect. So the system that generates the data then uh, looks like this. The target, I call it the target network. We have our real value, let me just work. So we have our, our standard sort of classic network. We have three layers, input, uh, hidden layers, and output. And so we'll work from top to bottom. The, the input is going to be uh, a bunch of random bits. These will just be uh, randomly chosen and with uniform distribution. So we have some, some input vector coming in. We uh, compute a bunch of features. And all these features are constructed from random weights. So when we choose those random weights, we determine those features. 
These features are going to be linear threshold units, so they're all going to be 0, 1. And just as an example, so there might be 50 of them. Okay, so that's the feature layer, the hidden layer. And then, uh, of course, those map with some output weights uh, to uh, our, our answer. And this is going to be the answer. This is going to be the targets. Uh, and we add a little randomness to the targets. Um, these, these output weights are not fixed. These are fixed. Okay, so really the goal is to find these guys. These are the ideal representations. You can find these features. You'll do well on this task. Um, and the, uh, the output weights are, well, just make them either plus one, zero, or minus one, and they will slowly change. So early on, you know, maybe these three features are positively weighted and other features negatively weighted, and some other features are zero weighted. And so that determines an input output mapping, and we can generate many, many uh, uh, examples. And, uh, and, and train our system. So um, it's natural if you have a problem like that, that your solution uh, will then also be of a network structure. Uh, you have to have the same inputs. You might have some other candidate features that you might hope uh, would be the same as these. If you did find these, uh, then you can, on this unsupervised learning, try to make the uh, try to match the data from this system with the system, system, we will do best if we find those features and give them the same weights that are randomly set here. Now, they're randomly set, but they're also slowly changing. So these will have to slowly change and track the answer. Uh, and so you'll always be able to measure the performance, the online performance, how well am I tracking? And if you have the right features, you'll be able to track really well. If you have silly features, uh, you won't be able to adapt as, as these weights slowly change. Um, so this is a direct test of our algorithm's ability to find good features efficiently. If we just run for a long, long, long time, and many, many examples, will, can we find those features, which is very hard to perform. So that's the, the challenge problem. I hope it's clear what these benefits are. But um, the number one benefit is that uh, it's a direct test a uh, direct measure of our ability to learn fast, right? Because we are continually measuring performance, and the answer is continually changing, and our ability to, to learn is, measured, is, is uh, represented or revealed with our ability to successfully track the target function. Uh, it's also a direct, I think, sensitive measure of the feature time. Um, so uh, the fast, for the fast learning, we can look at the asymptotic error, and for our ability to find the features, eventually we should find all the features. We can look at the rate of reduction. There is no domain knowledge. Maybe there's some domain knowledge about how, how the uh, target features are generated. But all of that's explicit. It's known. It's not, uh, it's not uh, hidden. It's uh, available to anyone who might work on the problem. And there's just a little bit of it, so you can fully take advantage of it. Um, there's no possibility of uh, Test set leakage, there's no possibility of hearing about the test set and, and being some, some outside way and, and doing better than, than someone else because, well, the, the test set uh, or the, the training data comes from these, these uh, made up problems and there's just no way you can know about them because you generate random target features each time. There's also no role for a positive proxy like trying to do auto encoding or simplicity or some other sub goal, uh, and uh, so we can we don't we don't have those uh, distractions. Uh, it's of course it's objective. You don't have to require human assessment. It's small and easy to implement. Anyone can implement this, this problem exactly as described uh, with, with random random weights and moving around. And uh, so if we look at all these benefits, um, it's really the first one. Uh, which is enabling faster learning, that it's because it's a non-stationary problem. All the other advantages come from being a synthetic problem. And uh, I am really keen on, I guess you guys are going to like this, I, I am really keen on, on this first thing. Uh, but all these others are important too, and we can test all these others with this test problem. And um, although I'm keen on this, I think it's the key thing. The fact is, the, the results that I have on this problem are all uh, deal with these things because uh, we don't really I, I don't really have results on the non-stationary aspect. 
But we can test everything else, and that's what I have some results on. Okay, so here's, here we go. The first thing you might do is you might uh, just have a bunch, make a bunch of features. Your target, your, your learn solution network, you can give it a great many random features, a great many random, static, unchanging features. Just kind of a baseline thing. Um, so the solution network here has many, um, all the input weights are, are constructed in a random way, just like the, the target features are constructed. And then we would learn the output weights by gradient descent, vary the number of features. And uh, in this example, there are 20 uh, uh, target features, and we're varying the number of, of uh, solution features, of learning solution features. So if we just have 100 random features, we can do a certain well. Uh, so this is um, the online mean square error performance, uh, or average over a number of runs as we get more and more data. And so we see learning curves going down. And we can see as we add more, uh, more and more uh, randomly constructed features, we can do it better. And until we eventually uh, uh, saturate or asymptote maybe around a million features. Um, so if you think about it, uh, how many possible features are there on this problem? Well, there's 20 input bits, and every um, Maybe I didn't say this explicitly, but all the features are constructed by, by um, connecting the input bits to the features with either a, a plus weight or a minus weight to make a, a recognizer for that feature being present, for that input being present. And so uh, there's exactly uh, 2 to the 20th, which is about a million possible features. If you give it a million randomly generated features, you can do pretty well, although you uh, doesn't guarantee you have them all, and, and because there's so many distractors learning from you still. Okay, that's, that's the solution idea number one. Now, if you think about how this works, you know, among those million or among those, oh, let's say, 10,000, um, many of them will be useless, and then a few of them may be similar to the, to the target features. Um, and so why not uh, sort them? Why not figure out which ones are useful and which ones are useless? Throw away the useless ones. Since more, more features generally helps, uh, throw away the useful ones and make some more random ones. Okay, so this is what I would call a generated test. And if you do that, you get this kind of behavior. So you get a distinct improvement. So, I don't know. Let's look at uh, this search or generated test uh, 10,000. If we just have 10,000 random features that are never changed, then we get this red line. But if we're able to sort them and throw away, gradually throw away the useless ones and make new random ones, uh, we can do much, much better. Okay, we, we, this is, even with only um, only a thousand features, we do much better than having a million fixed features. So if we are searching through feature space to find ones that will help us. Okay, now I'm sure you're asking, well, what about adding uh, our that is like backpropagation and gradient descent. And we can do that as well. Here's sort of a, a summary of what happens when you do that. Okay, so let me be clear. Uh, now we have, uh, I made the problem harder by adding 500 target features. And I'm restricting myself to just 1,000 solution features. So if those 1,000 solution features are just chosen randomly, never changed, you can do this well. If you do the search, you can do better. But if you do backprop is, is, is uh, we can do better, better still, because we're tuning and shaping them to be um, appropriate for, to, to flow more closely match the targets. But can we combine these two? So, so backprop also involves sort of some random generation, and, and here it's very explicit. The starting place for backprop is the initial features. The initial features are in fact exactly the same as the fixed representation. And then we start to uh, adapt them to get better and better performance. Um, but uh, how important is the fact that you're doing gradient descent and tuning, and how important is it that we started with random features? You know random features actually really affect lots of them to make them do well. So we, 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 the idea then I try to get to is we can combine the search, the generate and test search for features with the sort of slow tuning of um, of, of gradient descent. 
And I should say that in all these cases, everything is strongly tuned. This is actually the best that Ben backed up. This is the best that generated test search can do. Um, but we want to combine them. And uh, well, we actually, this actually is done in several stages. Um, first, we um, can modify backprop. And the first thing we modify with backprop is um, the output. Think about what backprop does. Uh, it actually does the opposite of searching for good features. If a feature has a good output weight, a large output weight, then uh, you're going to preferentially change it in the future because its gradients will be large. If something has a zero output weight, then you will never change it at all. You will not learn at all. So the, 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 the fact that the gradients multiply times the output weights gives us the opposite of what you would desire. You, you're not getting a generated test search. You're, you're uh, only moving the things that you've already found to be useful. Whereas the idea of generating test search is that we should uh, mess around with the ones that aren't useful yet uh, and preserve the ones that are useful. So, so you can make a step in this direction if you just modify backups so to ignore the size of the output width. If it's zero, you just look at the sign of it. If it's, if it's large, again, you just look at the sign of it. So at least you stop preferentially destroying the useful features. Okay, so if you do that, uh, here you would get the green line. And then if you, if you combine search, well, so it doesn't mean combine search with backup, it means um, you, you sort, uh, it's a bit, yeah, I guess it's written on the previous slide, you, uh, you rank the utility of your features, you sort them, and then you slowly replace the least useful the newly minted features. Okay? And, uh, that will do much better, will do significantly better than all the versions of that plot. It shows that both gradient descent and generate test search that can contribute to efficient feature finding. Now you can also add unsupervised learning. Instead of just having random features, you can have features that try to uh, adapt to the uh, distribution. And if I had more time, I would show you uh, uh, I would talk about this, but I want to go on and get to the fast learning part because really um, this, this, what I've been showing you so far is about how you can learn a complex function by generating a test and tuning using this generic feature finding, online synthetic feature finding problem. Um, so, so let's get back to the non-stationarity. And uh, I guess I might notice, maybe in passing, that uh, on a non-stationary problem, things like backdrop tend to perform poorly. I don't have exactly the result, um, but here's, here's some results on MNIST, where we've made a version of MNIST where the problem is non-stationary. Basically, you solve, uh, this is many, many uh, versions of MNIST, and each one differs because, well, like this first one would be ordinary MNIST, and then this, the next one would be the same the same endless, but you've changed the labels. What used to be uh, one, uh, a number one label is now a number two label. What used to be uh, number two is now three, and so on. So just by rotating the labels, you can get a sequence of tests. And you can ask how well that prop does here. And it does, uh, well, often, you know, typically do very well on the first one. And then as you get more and more tests, performance gets worse. Performance gets worse. It's the opposite of what, what I want. It's, it's as you get more and more representation learning, your ability to learn fast on a new problem gets worse. Uh, it's like your variation and your learning power gets used up on the early tasks. OK, so, um, so that's where we have some evidence that performs poorly. We catastrophic interference. There seems to be some need to protect useful features from being taken over by, by new learning. And so, uh, so let's make a problem that addresses this. And uh, the answer is going to be steps, perhaps surprisingly, is going to be step size adaptation, which we normally might think of just sort of a pesky little problem that we're, that we're how to set the step sizes, um, pesky little learning rates, and so um, But here's going to be a key part of the representation learning, a sculpting the representation so that we generalize better and learn faster in the future. So, just kind of quickly uh, suggest the problem, or let's see, a few 
more minutes. Um, maybe, uh, maybe we'll just do a picture. Okay, so here's here's the problem. It is similar to before, but it's actually simpler. We don't we only have the one layer because all we're going to do is adjust the emphasis on on the input signal. So you might think of the input signals as being features. These are all the data percolating up and down, both getting and you both perhaps useful information to the uh, to the decision maker, the guy who has to guess at the continued real value answer uh, on, on, my, on my way. Um, so, but in this here, the target process, we have a clear distinction. The first five features are important. Well, the later 15 features are actually ignored in all of the construction of targets, like the, the, the labels, the desired function ignores the, first, the last 15. It only pays attention to the first five. But as before, the weights on those first five are slowly changing. They're in fact, all either plus one or minus one. And what we do is every once in a while, we take one of them. If it's a plus one, we switch it to a minus one. Or we take one that's a minus one, we switch it to a plus one. And that happens slowly every once in a while. In fact, every, I guess every 20 steps, we pick one of the five and we flip the sign of its output. And, uh, and then we keep going. So the only way to win is to realize that the first five are the important one. The other ones are irrelevant. Okay, so uh, as before, the, the learning process can have a similar structure, but of course, everything is learned. We have 20, well, one weight for each feature and one step size, a separate step size for each feature. And we have to ask, can we find relevant features, separate them, track their weights? Uh, so the step sizes, interestingly, uh, determine the way we uh, generalize. And so I have a uh, particular uh, long-standing algorithm for doing this, mental delta by delta. And what I want to say about it is that it, it is able, we are able to find um, the, uh, the, the important step sizes. So here we have over time, uh, the step sizes for one of the relevant signals is going up, and uh, for one of the irrelevant signals, this is an example of one of the irrelevant signals is going down, and these are heading towards zero. This one seems to be heading about uh, maybe 0.13 is its step size. And if you separately test what is the best step size just by trying them all for the relevant figures, sig signals, you find that it's about 0.13. So we can find them, and they do result in much uh, faster learning, uh, much better non stationary performance on this problem. And so we can see that uh, we are. Uh, learning slowly to learn fast. Okay, so in summary, um, it really seems to me that a key part of representation learning is that it should enable fast learning. That was the original idea. The field has strayed for better or worse from this goal, but if we do want to pursue this goal, we have to go to an online continual learning setting. I propose a challenge problem um, that focuses explicitly on this, this uh, non-stationary feature finding problem. And, um, and avoids many of the methodological problems. And I present some results for the parts of it, uh, but not so far on, on the full Jeff challenge problem. So that still has not been squarely met. And I would recommend it all to you. Thank you very much. Okay, questions? This question, Anna. Go ahead. Yes? changing of the of the features uh, are because just every 20 steps or so you change them but then they change very rapidly not changing the features changing uh, the, 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 the consequences of the features the consequences that's right I hope they're, they're read out but uh, this changes can be very rapid from 1 yeah. to 0 or to minus 1 so yes. it might be much more difficult if it changes really slowly also you know it's getting less important and yes also done similar things where you are slowly drifting 
the, the, the output features to get uh, to get the non-stationary effect. That might be might be preferable. But I like kind of the, the, the very very crude directness of okay, it's a big change, you have to adopt it. But either way, good, thank you. Well, so as you saw, I, we made a version of MNIST that has a, that is non-stationary. Um, but the premise is that you know the real problem that at least we face in our lives is effectively a non-stationary problem. Uh, we we wake up uh, one day and we uh, we we have a sore foot and so we have to walk differently, or we need a new a new person and we have the problem of learning about that new person. That life is really full of repetitive uh, learning problems, and, um, and things change. The right answer changes, that's why we have to learn fast, rather than just learn once and be done. Um, so my question is, how do you convey to the veteran that you change the task? Do you just change what the labels are respond to? So you can, re repeat the whole thing again? How do you convey to the veteran that you've changed the task? Uh, so we don't. We just have a continual change in the in the input out, in the desired function, but that's very unfair. Well, so I mean, in fact, of course, we are conveying it by giving more examples. It makes a prediction that used to be right, and now it's it's wrong. But it's not. That, so you have features that are already. So when a person meets a new person, they have a new sample that you implicitly define a new task with a new sample of the task. You say here are some new samples, and these samples correspond to these whatever classes. But it seems to me that if you're not doing that, you're forcing the network not to perform well. Whereas if you kind of took the sampling approach, it, so the way I think about it, you, you would like to learn representation such that when you get new samples for a new task, you will learn quickly. I guess that's the definition of learning fast. So, so I'm resisting that. I consider it elegant that I don't have tasks. Okay. I don't have tasks uh, in, in the Jeff problem. It is uh, just continuing, life is changing, you have to adapt as it, as it changes. Uh, to introduce the concept of, of task, uh, you know, as a new commitment to this idea that there's a task, someone tells you that things have changed. And, uh, I mean, you can do that. I'm not against this. Sometimes it's useful, and we, there are multitask learning problems uh, made by, for example, people here that, that do get at this issue. But I do think, uh, my, my thing is it's more elegant that you have just continual changes there. No notification. Now is a change, and later it's not. Aaron, but uh, continual change suggests that there's a continual, a constant rate of change that you're that you're assuming implicitly. That's the case I'm looking at. A constant rate of change. The important is to have change. <laughs> In the back, there's some. That's right. So it's a shallow case. So, it, but I do think that we have to do the shallow case before we can do the deep case. Uh, but, but it would be perfectly possible to instead of having a two-layer network, have a recurrent, recurrent network. So that once you you have a good feature, you might then make new features. Uh, you might, in a non-stationary way, adapt uh, features that are made out of other features. So I think I just ask you to to accept that as the first step. We don't have any features. My claim for the Jeff problems is the first explicit problem uh, where we we are forced to find features which enable you to learn fast. And there isn't any existing problem, perhaps, or at least I don't know any that have that problem. Do you, do you have any thoughts on what would happen if you generate tests on hierarchical problems? Uh, I have all the same intuitions as, as you would have, and, uh, and of course I'd like to go there, but first we have to go, uh, and I I'm a little bit apologetic that I proposed this problem, but I don't have results on this full non-stationary feature finding problem. Um, but I don't think I don't think I think this is new to our field, so we have to we have to do this we have to walk before you can run. Maybe take one more question over here. If you have distribution of braids or chain, so what do you have more if you have if you have if you have what kind of braids? Some of them are slowly changing, some of them are faster, some of them are faster. Exactly, good. So if you think about the second problem I showed you, a step side adaptation, it was exactly that. Some units change and some don't. Okay? And so exactly you want to 
the ones that don't change, you want to learn their output weights and then never change them again. They don't change. The ones that are changing, those are the ones that are important for future learning. So you want to give them really a high step size. So you've got three critical I don't believe in critical values. I think uh, things vary in terms of how often they change. And we want to allocate our scarce learning resources on things that, that might actually change and need them. Okay, thank you everybody. Right. Thank you very much.